Welcome to Crosspoint. 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 An interactive program featuring ministers and leaders of the Christian community addressing the issues that are challenging the church today. Here's your host, Mark Taylor. Can there be hurts that are inflicted from the church? And how do you get past them? Welcome to Crosspoint. I'm Mark Taylor. Joe Dobbins is my guest today. He's a lead pastor, speaker, author, and serves in many ministries in leadership roles. Well, Joe Dobbins, thanks for being with us today here on Crosspoint. And you've written a book about something that if anybody's been in church for much of a long time, they've probably experienced a little bit of this. Some have experienced it in harsher ways, harder ways, more difficult ways. But you're talking about hope and or hope, but you but plus after church hurt. So, you know, I know you've got a story yourself here that you share about this, and I believe it's something probably we need to talk about because we lose people sometimes when they go to church, they get hurt, and then they don't want to go back. But you say here, right in the first, you say, uh, starting page 22, church hurt is a dysfunction that knows no boundaries and chooses no favorites. And then you say, you're no stranger to church hurt. So tell us a little bit about your story. Well, thanks again, Mark, for having us. Um, You know, the reality is I could tell you a lot of stories uh, from times when I was younger uh, to times uh, that, that even as I lead a church now, the reality is church hurt is unique. And it's something that I think we have to talk about. We have to, to no longer, you know, kind of put it under the rug, sanitize the ideas, even rationalize them away, because no healing comes in any of that. And with the reality, uh, you know, first and foremost for us, I remember when Kayla and I were getting married, um, we got married pretty young. And during our engagement period, her parents in particular did not, um, they, they just thought we were too young. They didn't really support the idea of us getting married. And that was something that was really, um, it was difficult for our family to go through. And so obviously when you're going through a difficulty like that, you begin to seek uh, counsel, uh, but also you begin to seek the heart of God. You know, my wife wanted to honor her parents, but also felt like we were supposed to get married. And one Sunday, she uh, went to her local church, and in her tradition, it wasn't unusual when someone was, you know, going through a situation where they're trying to hear the voice of God, that they would go to the front and begin to pray, kind of kneel down and pray. So she did that. She was up there seeking, and her honest prayer was, God, I want to honor you, and I want to honor my parents, and, um, you know, I need you to help me navigate this. Well, in her tradition, it's also not unusual for someone in that church to come up, a leader, to pray with you and and just comfort you, you know, be a support. Well, there was a leader who had heard about what was going on, uh, had heard some skewed views of the conflict in the family, and just took it upon themselves to go up and and decide to fix it. And she went up to Kayla, wrapped her arms around her, and then basically said, um, you know, your heart's in rebellion, you don't want to honor your mom and dad, you're you're being used by the enemy, and kind of just began to lamb blast my wife in front of the whole church. Well, the, the, the leader was wrong. She didn't have all the information, and she really overstepped. But what it did was so much more. First of all, it felt just complete rejection for us. But in addition to that, it, my wife felt like she lost her safe space. Like the idea that this is a sanctuary, a place that I could be uh, struggle and it'd be okay. And instead, this person's uh, overstepping harshness really caused her to step back. And, uh, and put up a lot of guards and some distrust for leaders. And so we had to walk through that. That's just one example uh, from our life. There are many others, but many of the people listening today, you know, some of them have been gossiped on. Some of them have uh, been a part of churches where the leader uh, presented one way and instead was another. And then some of them have even been abused in various forms. And so uh, church hurts something that is real. It's something that needs to be talked about, but it's but this is the best part. It's something you can heal from. I think this is a more serious issue in our church society of people that's got hurt. Now, I know that sometimes people have got hurt and maybe it really wasn't hurt or maybe they really did need some <laughs> straightening out on something. But I have talked to probably the majority of people, just probably like you have as well, of people that have uh, just like you know, you talked about people that say they're Christians, you're in the church with them, but you see them on the outside of the church and they never live like a Christian. And therefore you don't want nothing to do with it. That 
you know, well, why should I be a part of something like this? You know, grudge holding, you talk about that here in, in your book. I'm looking at page 31, and it says, if you've done any of this, you probably don't realize it's, it's a high, the high price. The Bible says, whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. Do you catch the holding a grudge keeps our relationship with God from growing? That word, the word really especially unforgiveness and that kind of stuff, not wanting to forget issues and stuff like that, that can really poison the church. Absolutely. I mean, you know, Scripture holds uh, such a clear view that believers, followers of Christ, are supposed to. It's not that they're not going to get hurt, and it's not that they won't, you know, basically hold resentment, but they have to be proactive in, in getting rid of it. Uh, Jesus talks about this again and again. And um, But yet, today, many people are at distance from the church because they have yet to walk the path of letting go of something that that happened. And if that's somebody listening today, I just want to say this. Forgiveness doesn't mean that um, you were wrong. It it means you were wrong. It doesn't mean that that you misunderstood. It didn't mean that the person, you know, is uh, righteous in what they did. But it does mean that you have a responsibility to walk through a, a pattern that is given to us in Scripture to deal with this in your heart. And here's the best news. Um, you don't have to get an apology. You don't have to uh, even trust the other person. You don't even have to go with, to church with the person again. You can forgive uh, all in your own decisions. And one of the ways that we do that, you know, is according to Scripture, the Bible says that first and foremost, forgiveness is not going to be a feeling. It's a choice. Second is is that it's a choice to really say this person doesn't owe me. They don't owe me an apology. They don't owe me restitution. They don't owe me, uh, you know, some kind of explanation. I'm just, I'm, I'm cutting this, this loose. They no longer owe me. But then what's going to happen is what's left after you make that decision are all the ugly feelings that you have towards this person. And Jesus gives us a very insightful way to handle those feelings. He says that we should bless those who curse us. Now, in my uh, practical understanding of that, that means that you begin to pray for the person who did you wrong. And what happens then when you begin to pray for them, and you say, what do I pray for them? Just pray whatever you would pray for yourself. You know, God, help them grow closer to you. God, help them uh, walk in a better understanding of who you are. God, bless their day. Just those kind of ideas. Here's what happens. All of the toxic resentment we hold gets flushed out every time we pray that. Now, let let me say, that's something you're going to have to do again and again, because forgiveness is not an event. It's an exercise. You don't go to the gym one time and walk out with a six-pack. You have to go again and again and again. And with forgiveness, we're going to have to bless them and pray for them and bless them and pray for them. But what happens is eventually those toxic feelings get flushed out of our heart and we begin to live in peace uh, and no longer allowing that resentment to hold us back in what God has for us. Okay, so let me ask you this now. If a person has been hurt in church or by Christians, let's just say by Christians, and so they really kind of avoid church, they don't want to go to church, but they can they still be a, a a follower of Christ, I mean, a good follower of Christ, because we're not supposed to pull away from everybody else. The Bible tells us, you know, we're not for, to forsake each other. How do how do we work through that? Oh, what a great question, and really the question of our day, in my opinion. So one of the most common mantras that you hear from people is, you know, I, I've got my own relationship with Jesus. Yeah. I'm, I'm a part. As a matter of fact, one lady said in the lobby of our church one day to me, she said, I love Jesus, but I can't stand the church. And what you have are people who say, um, basically, I'm following Jesus, and I'm just doing it my way. Well, here's what I would say. First and foremost, and I want to be clear, um, attending a church, being a part of a church, is not what verifies you being a follower of Jesus. The Bible's very clear, salvation's through faith alone. So the reality for us is faith alone, that Jesus is who he says he was, did what he said he did, that is enough to be a, uh, a Christian. But I want to get into the phrase, I'm following Jesus, because if you're following him, you're going somewhere, and he's leading you somewhere. And here's what Scripture's clear on. Following Jesus means Jesus always leads us to forgiveness. He will never lead us to keeping unforgiveness. Number two is he always leads us to healing. Some people uh, have, have decided that they're going to isolate, and what they've done is they've also stopped their healing process. But if they're following Jesus, he's always going to lead them to to full uh, healing. 
And then the other thing that we have to acknowledge is Jesus is going to lead us back to the church. Uh, I know there's a lot of debate today about the relevancy of the church and if it's something that uh, is even necessary, but let me be clear, that debate is not happening with Jesus. The Bible says he died for the church, he's the head of the church, and yes, he acknowledges that the church needs some work, and there's a continual working in the church, but it is what he is leading using, and it, he'll always lead us back to it. So I think it's important that if you're, you're the person who's saying, well, I'm following Jesus, but I don't have to be a part of a church, well, you may not, in fact, be following Jesus, because he always leads us back to forgiveness, healing, and rejoining his body. Well, yeah, and he says that's what he's coming back for. And, you know, he says he's coming back for a glorious church. So what we see happening in churches or people being hurt by churches, somehow this spins around because he's coming for a glorious church. He's coming for a great church. And so I I believe that God himself is perfecting the church, even though we see a lot of imperfections in it right now. And we feel them, you know, sometimes when you go there and stuff. But I believe if yeah. somebody is really wanting to follow the heart of Christ, uh, God's going to work in that church. Yeah. Now, you may need to change churches, individual churches, but I do believe Christ is always going to lead us back to engaging with a church, the church. Because, um, and, I, and I want people to know this, uh, in the book, I, I make it clear that when you are not a part of the church, there are some things you miss out on. But I also want to say this, there's things the church is missing out on in your absence. You have gifts, you have um, insights, you have experiences that we're better when you're apart. And so I don't want uh, anybody to think that it's just only about what they get, but also God wants to use your life in a significant way to help make that church a healthier place and that community a place where more people can come to know Christ. Yeah. Now, page, uh, looking at page 37 here in the book, it says, what was true of those before us is true of us. Honesty is a struggle. One of the biggest mistakes I see people make in pain, uh, make is thinking that they have to keep up appearances with God. We don't have to do that when we're struggling and have been hurt in the church or anything else. Uh, We just need to come to God with the hurt and leave it at that, and he'll take it from there. Absolutely. You know, I think a lot of times um, I describe it this way. As human beings, we're better survivors than resolvers. Yeah. And what that means is is that we, you know, when we experience an emotional trauma or we're done wrong, what we tend to do is press it down, push it away in our heart, sweep it under the rug of our, our emotional eyes, and just move forward. You know, we just rush to get back to normal. And the problem is, is our hearts hold on to those hurts. They don't just evaporate. And what happens over time is is that we keep pressing down hurt after hurt, and, and before long, you've lived years past the, the event, but you're still living with the dysfunction that that hurt caused. Maybe um, for some, you know, a leader treated you wrong, so now you don't have any uh, any use of leadership. You know, you, you're completely against all leadership. Maybe uh, someone gossiped about you, so you don't have any significant relationships. On and on the dysfunctions go, but at the end of the day, Um, What we have to do is recognize that moving forward and healing are two different things. And we don't have to act like we're not healed. We don't have to act like it didn't hurt. We don't have to act like that that wasn't a big deal. We get to come to Christ and be completely honest that what they said was hurtful, that what they did really wounded us, that what that, that person, that disappointment is still very real. And that's where healing begins is just being honest. Yeah, I, I agree. Now, chapter four is called hypocrisy. In fact, you've kind of got it divided out here. It's part two of the book, and it's finding God's path to healing. So down here at the bottom of the page 59, you said, let me make it clear. Hypocrisy is not when someone makes a mistake that's being human. Every one of us has said and done things that we wished we hadn't. And we all are in the process of being shaped into the image of Christ. Hypocrisy is when we claim to be one thing but consistently live contrary to it. It is when our public persona is different from our private character and we're okay with it. And then you talk even down there a little farther about hypocrisy in the early churches, and it had a crisis there as well. Yeah, I think if you talk to most people today who have a negative view of the church, hypocrisy is going to be one of the main reasons why. Uh, You referenced it a few minutes ago. The the, the challenge is is that Christians who say one thing, claim one thing, and act another. And um, here's what encourages me about the Bible, is that this is not new. Uh, the Bible is very clear that in the early church, particularly I talk about Acts chapter 5, 
that um, there was hypocrisy. Uh, two people named Ananias and Sapphira wanted to appear like they were operating in complete generosity when, in fact, they made some selfish decisions to hold back in their generosity. And the Bible says that God highlighted it and that the reputation or the way God dealt with it put fear through the church. And and that word fear there really means a reverence. And what what I believe God wants this to be is ultimately scared to death of hypocrisy, because uh, churches that get marked by hypocrisy are churches that lack power. We lose our influence. We lose, lose our witness. And so... You know, all of us uh, have seen people who have done things uh, out of hypocrisy, who have lived lives of hypocrisy. I mean, I, nearly every person seen in the news, some pastor that's presented one way and turns out that he had a whole secret life in another way. Yep. That's incredibly hurtful. It's incredibly hurtful. But it's, there's also a path to healing for it. And part of that path, I think, also causes us to look at our own lives and go, where is there um, incongruencies in my heart? What are some things that, what, what are the secrets I'm holding? What are the, the things that I'm presenting one way, but I, they're actually another? Um, and the truth is, the church will not be healed of hypocrisy till we're all honest enough to look at our own hypocrisy. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Well, folks, we're talking about hope after church hurt. Stay with us. We'll be back with more right after this. God's Word speaks truth. God's work speaks life, and God's Word speaks to us today. Hi, I'm Pastor John Marins of the Granby Christian Church. Each week we explore God's Word together on In the Shadow of Your Wings, a radio broadcast on KNEO. Tune in each Saturday at 6.45 p.m. to hear the show. And if you ever miss it, you can always view the archive online at KNEO.org. We also have the program available as a podcast as well, so you can listen anytime, anywhere. It's available from Sky High Podcast Network. I invite you to check out the show and learn more about our incredible God and how He cares for you. You can trust Him. You can depend on Him, and you can rest in the shadow of His wings. This is Mark Taylor. If you miss a broadcast of Crosspoint, you can always go to our website at www.kneo.org and click on the programs page. There you can access the current Crosspoint program as well as the last four programs that have been aired. Never miss another Crosspoint program again. Go to www.kneo.org today. You're listening to Cross Point. Thanks for joining us today. I'm talking with Joe Dobbins. He's a pastor and author. He wrote this book about hope after church hurt. Very good book because we've all experienced it if we've been in the church. But, uh, Pastor, if somebody would want to know more about this book, get a copy of the book, how would they go about doing that? Well, the book is, uh, I, I'm just so grateful that it's making its way into so many people's hands. Uh, it was just announced that it was the Evangelical Christian Publicist Association. Uh, it was a bestseller uh, for this this month. So you can get the book, Barnes & Noble, Amazon's probably your quickest space, or Baker Bookhouse. Uh, all of those places can get you the book, and I hope that you'll read it because I believe it will help you with its very positive approach. You know, I feel like a lot of people get so discouraged when they're dealing with church hurt. This is, I hope, to be a voice of hope for people that want to walk out healed. The second thing is, it's very pragmatic. I actually talk about eight different types of hurt. And so you could get the book and very quickly move to the one you feel like you've endured. And then finally, it's filled with personal stories. Um, You know, it's real raw. It's it's authentic. It's um, just honest about things that I've personally been through, that I've walked with people through. And I hope that in those stories that that basically you'd be able to find yourself and find that there's a path for healing. Yeah. Do you think, and you talk about it here in the book, in this area of the healing here, judgmentalism is is this area I'm looking at right now. But do you think that one of the reason, top reasons people leave the church is not because they maybe just fit in, but because of judgment they've received in the church? Yeah, research shows that that's actually the top response for people when they talk about the negative trends of the church, that they fear being judged. And there's no doubt about it that if you've been around church any amount of time, you have probably uh, endured some measure of judgment. could be for something you wore, something you said, something you participated in, or something that happened in your past. And um, I talk a lot in the book or the chapter on judgment about how to heal from it. And I'm going to tell you where judgment um, 
starts, the healing for it starts, is when we take God's opinion of us over everybody else's opinion of us. You know, the reality is, is that um, I can only be judged by you if I give you the authority, if I give your voice authority in my life. And the top authority in our lives needs to be God and his view of us. And so I talk about the very specific way that God values your life the way that he uniquely made you, and how despite maybe problems, mistakes, or or things that you're even presently struggling with, you still hold such a high value to God that when you grasp that, it really begins to negate any judgment someone else has cast on you. Well, and I think that helps us, you know, because there's millions of people that love Jesus that struggle with going to church. I mean, and and I believe it's becoming more evident in the day that we live uh, just because of the, I think maybe the the darkness, the the things we're experiencing in our society today, the cultural shifts and that kind of stuff, and people want to reach out to the church, but they're struggling. What do you tell people like that that says, well, I, I'm just wanting to find my place where I'd fit in? I think what I would say is that, first and foremost, um, man, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you for not giving up, uh, for for taking the step to begin to find your place in your community. And I also want to encourage you that God's going to help you do that. You're not on your own. You're not out there just, you know, trying to to meander through that God has a place for you to fit. The Bible tells us that God knits together his body, his community. And so I I believe that the Holy Spirit's going to begin to lead you into uh, relationships, lead you into connections that will help you find that space. But l- let me just say this to anybody that has experienced church hurt. Um, I think this is so important. Healing begins with a decision. You're not going to stumble into healing. You're not going to trip into it or one day arrive to it. It starts with a decision. In John chapter 9, uh, Jesus comes to a man one day who's been laying by a pool, uh, lame for 30 plus years. And Jesus asks him a very odd question. He says, do you want to be well? This is so odd because the whole man's identity shows that he is basically uh, impaired. But Jesus asked him this because um, healing begins with a decision. And it's a partnership between us and God. And um, you never find in Scripture Jesus healing anyone against their will. You know, he he doesn't go, well, I'm going to heal you. I don't care if you like it or not. The reality is, is that we have to give him permission, and we do that with a decision to say, you know what, it's time to heal. And then the second thing is, is we have to dedicate time to it. Um, You know, in the Bible, uh, particularly in the New Testament, there are miracles listed and healings. And sometimes we use those words interchangeably, but let let me say it, I, I think they're listed uniquely for this reason. Miracles are when God does something instantaneously, whereas a healing is when God does something incrementally. And, and so what I want to make sure that people understand is, is that if God's going to heal you, it's going to be step by step. Uh, it's going to be, you know, little by little. Don't, don't get discouraged that you didn't go, you tried one time and it didn't all come back together. Um, it's, it's a process, and it means you're going to have to give time to it. And I know, you know, we're in such a busy culture today where people go, I don't have time. I read recently that the average person reads 265 DMs, emails, texts every day. So here, let's just be honest. We have the time. We just need to redirect the time to healing if we've been hurt in church. Yeah. Now, an area, chapter 7, you talk about a sexual abuse, acknowledging the pain. And then on page 97, you at the top of one of your areas here, you talk about our sexuality is a major target of our enemy. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, you can't write a book on church hurt without acknowledging the thousands of people who have experienced what I believe may be one of the most painful and heinous acts that could be committed towards another human being, and that's sexual abuse. And I wish that it wasn't true, but the truth is we've all seen uh, news reports of people who were abused by someone in spiritual authority, were abused by in, in secret. Uh, they've had to live with years of suffocating shame, and um, and and their their path for healing is specific, and it's one that um, may take quite a bit of time. I, the, one of the reasons that I think that it's so devastating, and and what you're referencing in the book, is that our sexuality is one of the most complex things God made about us. When He created us, He created us physically, He created us emotionally, and He created us uh, spiritually. And cer- certain pains that we go through uh, don't include all three parts of our being. 
for example, if you stub your toe, uh, that's a physical hurt, but it's not necessarily an emotional or spiritual hurt. Well, when it comes to our sexuality, it's one of the unique things First Corinthians 6 says is that um, our sexuality is not just mere skin to skin, but it includes our emotional and spiritual person. And so when someone is wounded through sexual abuse and they're uh, mistreated and victimized, here's what happens. It affects them physically, it affects them emotionally, and it affects them spiritually to the very core of who they are. And that's why that, um, you know, it, it, it can change the course of that person's entire life when something like this happens. And so I, it's the only hurt I dedicate two chapters to in the book. And here's the truth. Those two chapters are just the beginning of what God wants to do. There could be whole volumes written on the help people need. I do share a personal story um, that I wasn't abused, but I share a personal story of how it's so easy in a church setting for our sexuality to be targeted. And I'm just hoping that through um, my honesty, through the scriptures, that people can begin to see there is a path forward despite this awful, awful experience they've had. Well, and another one that you mentioned in here is chapter 9, Disappointment with Leaders. And over here on the opposite page, 117, you said, The failure of a faith leader carries an extra measure of sting because the nature of their calling is to display better than others the character of the one who called them. Then you say, sadly, the reality that many people who lead in the name of Jesus lead nothing like Jesus. That's pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's maybe the most um, common topic right now. It feels like every time we turn on the news, uh, a well-known faith leader seems to we have discovered that they weren't who they claimed to be. And um, and and I want to talk about this for a second. You know, um, this isn't something that is new. This is something that we see leaders fall in Scripture, leaders fall throughout church history, but it still hurts significantly. You know, C.S. Lewis said, "Of all bad men, religious bad men are the worst." And um, so if you, you're disappointed by someone who's embezzled funds, someone who abused someone else or lived a second life, or someone who, whose leadership was harsh and ungodly, let, let me just say, first and foremost, this is why Jesus said, follow me, not follow my followers. I think that in these moments, we're quickly reminded that sometimes we put too much confidence in leaders. And the reality is, is that um, those moments of honesty are, are reminders. We follow Jesus. We do not follow his followers. But if you're struggling with that, I want to tell you that two things that can encourage you. They've encouraged me uh, in the wake of disappointment with leaders. Number one, God understands. You know, Jesus was mistreated by a lot of people, but he was the but m- the most severe mistreatments Jesus endured were at the hands of religious leaders. Yes. So when you face disappointment, you face hurt, or you yourself are mistreated, I want you to know that God understands. He He fully grasps it. And here's the second thing I want you to know. God is just. Sometimes we hold on to pain almost as evidence of the wrong done. And that's why we won't get rid of it is because we feel like if we do, it's letting them off the hook that justice won't be served. You know, a a detective at a crime scene goes through a tedious process to collect all the evidence, and he stores it away to ensure justice will be served. Well, in Psalm 58, the Bible says that God collects our tears in our painful moments. And I always thought that was an interesting verse. And one day I felt like the Lord spoke to me and said, one of the reasons I collect your tears is proof that you were wronged. And in the same way a detective t- takes all that evidence, God holds your tears as evidence to, of the wrong done to you, and then this is what happens. It helps him enact his justice. No one, no one is outside of God's justice. God sees all. He knows all. He knows what was done, said. He knows the true story, and he will not let anyone get by without enacting his justice. And so what happens is because he's collected our tears, we can release our pain and trust that he is going to see the right thing done in this situation. Yeah, and we've got to remember that a lot of times. We we want to help yeah. be a part of that process. And sometimes he says, no, 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 you can't be any part of that. Let me take care of this. And, yeah, let him fight our battles, and we got to stay out of the way. So, hey, uh, again, tell people now – Hope After Church Hurt. Tell people how they can, again, find this before we go to the next break. 
Yeah. Hope After Church Hurt, um, if you want to Google it, Amazon right now, you can get an audio book, you can get a digital version, or you can get a, a paperback copy, or go to your uh, local uh, Christian bookstore, Barnes & Noble, Baker Bookhouse. Those are all great places to get the book today. All right. Well, we were talking with Joe Dobbins today, and we're talking about something that goes on in the church, folks. Stay with us. we got another segment coming up. Hi, I'm Sue Taylor, and I host the Faith to Live By podcast, available from the Sky High Podcast Network. Are you looking for a little spiritual pick-me-up as you begin your day? Each weekday morning, I have a short devotional thought to get you going and give you something to reflect on as you go about your day. Faith is not just something you need when you get saved. Faith is something you live by. Look up Faith to Live By with Sue Taylor wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe today. A place of hope. Place. Christian Radio is encouraging you. Encouraging. It's lifting you up. It's speaking positive stuff to you. It's reminding you, oh yeah, God is bigger, bigger. than what you're going through. God is greater. Experience hope on 91.7 The Word. Thanks for joining us today here on Crosspoint. Interesting discussion. And Pastor Joe Dobbins with me. We're talking about hope after church hurt. Chapter 11, Pastor, it says, and I think this is a big issue, and it's a hard, to me, maybe it's one of the harder issues to, to work with because you get two or three people involved here, maybe more. Unresolved conflict. It says clearly conflict is a fact of life. Whatever, whenever there's two people disagree or inevitable because at some point what one wants, the other one opposes. But how do we resolve this when we've got conflict? And sometimes this conflict can grow in a church. It might start with one person, maybe two, but you can end up sometimes with half the congregation involved. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I actually think this may be uh, one of the most important chapters for the point you just made, how conflict just seems to spread so rapidly. And that could be, I mean, people have conflict over what color the carpet is in the new sanctuary, and they have conflict over leaders, and they have conflict over uh, just, you know, small things even. And here's what the irony is, is that in some ways, and I, I cite some research, Christians tend to be the worst at handling conflict, yet Jesus is clear in how to handle it. And so in this chapter, what I do is go step by step to exactly what Jesus says we're supposed to do when we're in conflict. And the, it begins with this, is that you have to take initiative. The reality is, is that for many of us, uh, we have decided to avoid, we've decided to, to kind of just move aside or even just, um, you know, take our conflict and, and handle it in dysfunctional ways. At some point for for conflict to be handled healthily, it has to require somebody to step forward and go first. Yeah. And um, so I encourage people to read that chapter. It goes step by step with exactly what Jesus says. And here's the benefit of handling conflict the right way. Um, Jesus actually ties it scripturally um, to our ability to agree with each other in prayer. Many uh, of our listeners have maybe heard the scripture before that where any two or three agree I am there also. Um, you know, when we keep conflict, we actually um, disable spiritual power and authority that God wants to war- operate in, in our lives. So because it's very difficult to agree with someone in prayer you're in conflict with. So I really try to raise the bar in that chapter on the idea of don't keep conflict because not just because it's, it's you know, painful, it causes us to lack of peace, but because it really takes a lot of the power that God's given us out of our ability to connect with a faith community and to see some of his greatest miracles take place um, because we can't agree with someone we're in conflict with. Yeah. Now, part three of the book in, in chapter 13 there, you talk about developing staying power. And you say, and this is hard to do if you're in a place you really don't want to be, but then you know you really need to be there. But stay planted where God's placed you. How do you get through that? when you're struggling with things that are going on in the church and you just want to be done with it. Yeah, and I want to be clear that um, in the book I also talk about how to leave a church well. So this is not one of those things that I'm encouraging people to stay in abusive situations or in bad theology or, or you know some kind of toxic environment. The reality is sometimes it's very much God's will that you move to another faith community, and I talk about how to test that. Here's what I think it really starts with is, is um, seeing it as not our choice 
but as following the Holy Spirit's leading. Um, I think for many of us, when things get tough, we sometimes bail uh, because our feelings are leading our decision making. And and let me just say this, that um, your feelings were given to enhance your life, but they weren't given to rule your life. And so one of the first realities for all of us is we have to keep coming back and going, have I made Jesus Lord of this discomfort or this pain? Um, Because your feelings will never lead you to a productive or healthy place. And so I think starting with that and saying, okay, I'm not the one just making this decision out of my discomfort. I'm choosing to submit this decision to the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to follow his leading. And then out of that, I think the Holy Spirit, um, you know, following peace is either going to allow you to move and reconnect in a different place, or he's going to cause you to, to stay because there's something that he's using you to positively help in maybe a tough season. You know, the reality is, is that churches are made up of people, and people go through seasons, and we're not always at our best. And so um, the staying power idea is is that if we keep just jumping every you know to a new place every single time that something uncomfortable happens, we're going to miss out on a lot of character development. We're going to miss out on being a part of being used by God in a positive way. We're going to miss out on a lot of good things. Um, and so allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us in that is it time to stay or is it time to discern to go is essential to make sure we don't miss out on something He has for us. Like what you say in chapter fourteen, be responsible for your own growth. Uh, yeah, that's really important for us to to know that. Hey, you know, no matter what everybody else is saying or doing or whatever, we're responsible for ourselves. Oh, isn't that so true? I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I've heard people say things before, like, "Well, I just, uh, you know, that I wasn't getting fed there, I wasn't growing there." Well, the truth is, is that you can grow in any circumstance. Right now, while you and I are speaking, there are brothers and sisters in Christ who are in China, they're be given, you know, just pages of the scripture. Uh, they're in an underground church for the threat of the government, and they're growing spiritually. So, you know, it, the reality is we are responsible for our own growth. Jesus says this as much when he talks about the parable of the sower. He says that it's the seed that actually, the seed in the soil that matter, not the one throwing the seed. And it feels like sometimes we put so much weight on, you know, the sower. How does he sow? Where does he sow from? I, is he so? Is it funny when he sows? Is it insightful when he sows? Does he sow verse by verse, or does he sow topically? Well, Scripture just doesn't even acknowledge any of that. He's nameless, faceless. What really matters is the condition of the soil. And the truth is, is that I'm responsible for the soil of my heart. Um, I'm responsible to keep it open and ready and willing to receive the Word of God. And so I talk about the essential, the essential. Uh, personal relationship that every person needs to have with the Bible every day. Um, you could go to the best church and not grow spiritually because you do not have a relationship with God's Word every day. And I, I tackle some of the challenges there. So if you're listening and you've struggled with, you know, just reading the Bible, understanding the Bible, that chapter is going to be an incredible encouragement and helpful to you. Joe, in this book, I know that you're talking about people that's been hurt in the church, but leaders get hurt. Leaders go through 20 years or whatever of giving their life to a church and then in the end maybe have a bad group of people get in there and go against them and pretty much run them out of the church to where they don't ever want to go back to church and pastor another church. How do you do you speak to any of that in the book? Yeah, absolutely. Every chapter is written that no matter where your position is in life, that you could, uh, it acknowledges the pain you may have dealt with. And it also acknowledges the path forward, particularly leader struggle. I would point to chat, the chapter on rejection. And I tell some stories in that chapter about um, pains that I endured as actually a leader, not as a, as a person who uh, is just attending a church. And so, um, you know, I do think it's essential that leaders pick up uh, this book and begin a healing journey. And here, here's why. Everything that we do comes out of what Scripture calls the wellspring of our heart. And so let, let me say this. If your heart's filled with anger— Every decision you make, every sermon you preach, every class you lead will come through anger. Uh, if your heart's filled with, um, you know, basically sadness or, or inferiority, everything you do will be laced with sadness or inferiority. So the, the, I always say this, the number one job description of a leader is to tend to their own heart. 
because I recognize whatever's in me is what I'm giving in portion to those who are following me. So I definitely believe that um, uh, church leaders, uh, whether that's volunteer or vocational, need to spend time making sure their heart is clean and healed. Because um, at the end of the day, let's consider this, enduring hurt hardens our hearts. And how can you represent a God of love if you cannot love? And so it's essential to being effective is having a healthy heart. Okay. Now, I know faith plays in it, and you talk about that in Chapter 15, about being flexible with your faith. How important is it to, to, to allow, you know, your faith to lead you when you don't understand what's going on in the church? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I actually, that's the chapter where I, I kind of talk about the checklist I, I suggest someone goes through when they're considering leaving a church. Um, that there's just some questions that they should ask themselves and then follow through to make sure not to make a misstep. But, you know, that flexibility idea really just boils down to this. Um, we love control. <laughs> and um, that's a toxic trait about every human being uh, because we've been called to walk by faith. And so um, I talk about the necessity to, if you're really going to receive everything God has for you, you have to have a flexibility about you. You have to recognize things aren't always going to be the way that you thought they were. They aren't always going to happen the way that you preferred. But if you can keep kind of an elasticity to your faith, you're going to receive more than um, other people who have become rigid and unmoving in their faith. I mean, how many churches do you and I both know that once were thriving, but their refusal to change has now caused them to be just a shell of what they once were in their effectiveness? And so the reality is, so is our ability to change, is our ability to continue to be used by God in a significant way. And that's true for churches, but it's also true for people. Now, another portion there, you talk about unity, commit to unity. And then, you know, how do you keep unity? Now, you also talked about leaving a church well. You know, how do you go about leaving a church well when you know you need to leave? Well, once you've uh, decided, you know, with the Holy Spirit's, uh, you know, following kind of the path that I lay out, but also, you know, being led by the Holy Spirit, that it's time for you to move. Um, to another church, um, you know, there is a way that you leave well. I mean, that means that, A, I'm not going to leave with any offenses. I'm going to do the work it takes to resolve offense. The second thing that I think is it means I'm going to leave honoring. I'm not going to leave, you know, bad-mouthing people or, you know, giving uh, kind of shots uh, of people, uh, things I disagreed with as I leave. And then the last thing that I think is that I'm not trying to build a coalition of everybody to follow me. You know, one of the mistakes we make is we want to reinforce our decisions with other people joining us. Well, what if God's calling you to go somewhere else, but he's not calling everyone else to do it? And so just allowing the Holy Spirit to lead each person individually, I think, is uh, uh, very important. But I I want to encourage anybody who's kind of in a season where they think they may be leaving where they they currently are a part, um, do it well. Because um, the way you exit, I believe, allows God to bless you in your entrance somewhere else. If you exit poorly, I feel like your heart, you know, is, is toxic or it's it's uh, filled with resentment. Well, you may change addresses, but the same heart's going to that new address. So make sure to do the work to leave well so that you enter this next season in peace and can receive God's favor. Towards the end of the book there, uh you you talk about our lives like the History Channel. Uh, you said God doesn't see you from your present mess. He's standing in your future. Really, you talk about our better days are ahead. I guess if we do it God's way, that's always the truth, isn't it? Yeah, God has this incredible way of redeeming uh, our missteps, our mistakes. In that illustration, I basically say we get to watch our life like the news. You know, when you watch the news, anxiety rises because all of these issues that we watch, whether it's an international issue, a crisis, uh, an economic issue or crisis, we're watching them in real time and we wonder how it's going to work out. But God watches our lives like we watch the History Channel. He already knows how it's all going to work out. Chances are, if you've ever watched the History Channel, you've not been watching something about the Civil War and you get anxious because you don't know how it's going to end. You already have an understanding how it works out. And that's the way God sees our lives. He understands how to take the missteps, the mistakes, the things we do wrong, the things that are done wrong to us, 
And somehow, in Romans 8, 28, he says, he works them and works them and works them together for the good. I use the illustration of a coffee maker. You know, a coffee maker, um, every part of it's not good. You know, uh, the filter is not very tasty. Uh, the coffee grounds are not really enjoyable if you ate them by the spoonful. Hot water by itself is not something that I find appetizing. But at some point, a master craftsman decided that he could take all that and work it together to produce a cup of coffee that's very good. Our lives are that way, that this season in the church, uh, that past hurt, that abuse, what they said, what you did, all of that's not good. But somehow as a master craftsman, God comes in and weaves it and works it all together that it can actually produce uh, a hope-filled and preferred tomorrow. Now, when you have people come into your church, and sometimes as a pastor, you know, you want to know a little bit about them, and you might pick up on that they've been hurt in church before, and so they've had some negative experiences, and it's difficult for them to really engage into the church they're now in, coming to your church. How do you try to help those people do that? I think that today, honestly, five out of ten people that come into my church are probably coming from uh, a previous church, uh, and many of them have been hurt. And I think what we always do is we don't um, let them settle on the past. You know, my conversations aren't about, you know, all the things that were wrong, reinforcing those bad memories, but instead I want to show them a path forward. So if you're a leader here today and, and you lead a church, one of the best things I think you could do is when you meet someone um, would be maybe even gift them the book and just say, hey, I want to give this to you. I know you came out of something that's tough. I want to give this to you because I believe God's got a, a great uh, future for you here, but you're going to have to heal from that. The reality is that um, we have to take the time to heal. And I think if we rush people through, if we assume everything was great, we often miss things. And before it's all said and done, if people don't heal, here's what happens. Eventually, the patients start running the hospital. And instead of helping each other, they just bleed on each other. And that's how churches turn toxic is when we don't create space or a process for people to heal. Maybe that is be good for churches sometimes where they, I know not all do, but some have, you know, new members a class you know or something like that and that should always be something that is tried to be talked about does anybody here that you know that's come in with that might want to talk about a little bit to see make sure it doesn't happen because i know sometimes some people carry issues with them (laughs) that no matter what church no matter what church you're in it's going to be a problem yeah absolutely you know i'm hearing from churches all across the nation that are using this book as a gift to first-time guests uh, just, to, you know, it's a gift uh, when they find someone that's come from another church, they just gift it to them. I've heard of people that are doing it as small groups, even pastors that are using it for material to preach out of so that their whole church can make sure they're healed and able to move forward together in a new measure of unity. And so I think any way that we help people heal is always going to pay off for us. Well, the book's entitled Hope After Church Hurt. And we've been talking today with Pastor Joe Dobbins. Uh, Pastor, tell people how they can find out more about this book. Please uh, go to Amazon.com. Uh, you can pick up the audio. You can pick up the paperback or the digital version. You can also go to BakerBookhouse.com. And I just want to challenge uh, your, your listeners today. You know, First and foremost, maybe you're a person who has been hurt. This has felt like a very relevant conversation to you. Um, I, I, I realize there's a lot to your story, and I would never assume that I've got it all figured out. But I want, I want you to know this. I would love the honor of coming alongside of you in this book and helping you take your first steps. And let's just see where God leads it. Let's not assume that it's the answer to everything, but let's just see where God leads it. Why don't you pick up a copy of the book today to just begin your journey? And then the other person that may be listening is someone who, who you're not really hurt but man, do you know so many people that are. And here's what I think God wants to do. I think he wants to use you to be a miracle for someone else. I want to challenge you to order a copy of the book and give it to the person that's on your mind or your heart today. This is a person that hadn't been to church a long time, a person who the last time you heard, they were very hurt. I want you to order that copy and be an active living part of the family of God, reaching out to someone who's disconnected. And, um, and I think God could use your kind gesture to start someone else's healing journey. 
Well, Pastor Joe Dobbins, thanks for being with us today here on Crosspoint. Honored. Thank you again. Well, that was a good interview today, folks, and uh, I believe a lot of people could use that book. Me as well. That's a good book to read and to go through. Uh, I believe the pastor's heart's in the right place wanting to help people, and he got all that from the Bible, the book in my other hand right now, the book that you need to have in your hands as well every day. So a good copy of that, a copy of the Bible. Uh, You can do a lot of good things for a lot of good people out there that need help. Folks, the Bible you need to know it. It's the instructions for life. Leads you down the road of life the way you need to go. It's inspired words of God. That's why it works so well. It accurately directs your life. The Bible contains the most important words you're ever going to read and certainly ever follow. Be sure and join us next time as we again discuss issues that are affecting the church. Have a great week. Allow God to use you for His purposes so that greater things can be done. Make your life count in God's plans for eternity. I'm Mark Taylor. Crosspoint is a program produced in Studio 101 at KNEO Radio. Not all of the views on Crosspoint reflect those of the management or staff of KNEO. You may contact the Crosspoint program at 10827 Highway 86 East, the Osho, Missouri 64850, or by email crosspoint at kneo.org. You can hear Crosspoint four times a week, Saturday morning at 1, Saturday afternoon at 2, Saturday evening at 9, and Sunday evening at 7. You can also listen anytime online at kneo.org. Never miss your favorite show again. For more than 30 years, KNEO has been bringing you great Bible teachers on a local and national level. And now, we've made it easier than ever to hear from these great men and women of God. KNEO's entire lineup is now available to listen anytime, anywhere through our website. Go to KNEO.org slash podcast to see all the options. You can search for programs alphabetically, or you can select individual categories like culture, kids, leadership, or music. We even have a category just for locally produced programs, so you can hear from pastors and spiritual leaders located right here in the four-state area. And... All these resources are absolutely free. Kaneo's mission is to get God's Word in front of you, and this is one of the ways we do it. Give it a try today. Go to kaneo.org and click on the podcast tab to get started. Harper's Kennel of Stella, Missouri is proud to be sponsoring this portion of broadcasting on KNEO. Owned by Judy and Danny Harper, Harper's Kennel of Stella, Missouri specializes in French Bulldogs. For more information, the phone number is 417-628-3083.